Welcome uh, to Learning2 Virtual Thread. My name's John Micton. Uh, I'm one of the coach and mentors for Learning2 Europe and uh, very excited to have our guests here today and you as participants. And what we're going to do is re-explore that topic that we actually had it about four or five weeks ago, I think, Stephen, I forget. It's been a while, but we uh, actually talked about what reopening would look like. And now that we have uh, schools that have reopened, uh, we thought it'd be nice to get four different schools in Europe to share some of their workflows and the creative tensions are going with, and then maybe piggyback on the topic. Now that we've reopened, what's next? Uh, many of us are going into the summer, uh, the fall. We always have a variety of events and you know, there are new teachers coming in, new students, people departing. How do you manage all that with the constraints that we have? And each one is very local and, and, and different, but what are we doing and what are some ideas maybe as a group here we can share and exchange some uh, concepts and suggestions and ideas and see where that takes us. But uh, I think what's really uh, exciting is to have people here talking on the topic and feeling really uh, willing to share out because there's any idea and anything uh, definitely can be something that somebody else can evolve with. So uh, I want to welcome our guests. I'm gonna, just going to go round the clock. Uh, our first guest from Bavarian International School is Kim, and then I'm going to have them each introduce themselves and do a little intro about their situation, and she's at Bavarian International School. And then Will Kirkwood, who's at Zurich International School, and just down the lake from him is Chris Vincent, who's at the International School of Zug in Lucerne, and then uh, Larry Love at the American School of Paris, and they're going to well, it's been about 15 minutes. They're going to uh, kind of introduce themselves and then they're going to do a short little presentation. We have a slide deck, which I'll share, and they're going to kind of highlight some of the uh, creative tensions that they're working with, with their situation, everyone very different. And then we'll open it to the floor and let the panelists answer questions. And also, if you have remarks or anything you feel you want to share, we're really keen to hear from all of you uh, in this Zoom call. So with uh, no further ado, I'm going to ask Kim if you can kind of kick off and just give us a little introduction and kind of set the scene where you guys are. All right. Are we going to have our slides up or no? Oh, uh, yeah. I will put the slide up for you. Just hold on, Kim. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Just bear with me. And up. Oh, Stephen, can you let me share the screen, please? Thank you. So um, I'll just talk while that's coming up. Um, I'm at the Bavarian International School, which is in just outside of Munich, Germany. Um, we are a K to 12, pre K to 12 school, um, three year olds up to 18, grade 12. Uh, we have about a thousand students, um, and right now they are they have come back to school um, in alternating weeks. So in primary, we have three grades on site at a time and then um, in the alternating week after another three grades come in and in secondary they can only accommodate about one grade level per uh, per day per week so it's um, not a lot of secondary school, school kids coming back at the moment it's one day a week for each grade level um, and we have still have to keep two 15 um, kids in each class so that's put a lot of stress on on the space and on the system and on how many teachers there are of course i'm sure that sounds familiar to lots of you um, our future uh we're really just waiting on on some government decisions we're very much tied to whatever the bavarian state government tells us we need to do so we are fully anticipating um still being in some sort of situation like this um, in august when we start back again um, and are making preparations for that uh, we felt really solid with uh, where we were at with distance learning, and I think coming back has been a real adjustment. Um, just a lot of um, compromises along the way that people are having to sort of live with. Every part of the community is kind of living with different compromises um, to make this situation work. Um, and then I guess my learning from this, um, there's been a lot of learning, uh, just how important it is to keep that, um, that communication and feedback going. Um, We've been giving students, parents, teachers an opportunity weekly um, to give us feedback, very open, very honest feedback. It's all shared out um, with the community. 
um, so people feel heard and then really reacting to that. So if there's a lot of people saying something, then our principal's coming to us as teachers and saying, hey, we've got a lot of parents saying they're confused about this or they're struggling with this at home. Um, and so really listening to what the community is saying and responding or letting them know why we can't respond to that in the way that they want um, has been important. And I'm sure everybody will say connection, um, how important it is to keep the kids connected. Those just shutting off and only having online learning with no face-to-face -face or Google Meets or, or Zoom meetings with the kids, I think it really wouldn't work. The kids are really, really excited for that, even that little bit of time that they're getting with us on screen. Um, and then I really thought it was gonna be with tech being the, the ad tech coach, I thought this was kind of gonna be our gateway drug basically into like everybody getting on board with all kinds of all the things I've been really quickly realized like, whoa, Kim, put the brakes on. They just want what they need at this very moment in time. They're, they're only ready for that um, and just meeting people where they're at, which is always our motto. But I was excited at the beginning, like, oh my gosh, they're all gonna use all these tools and we're gonna be, everybody's gonna be tech wizards, but really they just wanted exactly what they needed in that moment to get going. So we're, we're getting there though. So I will pass it on to the next person. Great, thank you so much, Kim. That's really a, a great overview. And I think there's some themes there that we'll have to definitely come back because I, I think some things that you said, especially about uh, the tech and people just wanting the essentials to survive and that tension that you highlighted of, you know, we kind of got digital learning under our belt and now having to come back, that's a whole new complication. And I think those will be interesting themes to come back to. Uh, our next uh, guest is uh, Larry. Uh, let me just get to our... Oh. Yeah. Just while the slide's coming, so oh, Larry yeah. Love, oops, is it coming? Yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead, Larry. I'm going so, to... Um, so I'm at the American School in Paris, in France. Um, we've got about 880 kids from three-year-olds to 18-year-olds. Um, so we, I mean, we've, we've sort of gone through these similar experiences. I can really relate to what Kimberly was saying, where she talks about that whole, you know, we, we were all in all of these forms talking about this great opportunity that we have for teachers to try out new things and they have, it's great. But in the, in the long haul, it's a matter of looking after teachers, um, emotional health and everything as well and making sure they have what they need. Anyway, so I guess thanks to, um, we've had great leadership from Jane Thompson, our head of school, a really great communications team, and that's proven to be really, really important. Um, we feel as if the, and our, and our coaches, our teachers have been fantastic, innovative and, and really supportive. But I think that what we're really uh, understanding now is how much we're missing out on. You know, I, I think, you know, I've always been a bit of a fan of, of the idea of there are some things that you, maybe you can learn better in this sort of mode, you know, when you, it's a really super blended learning approach. but the truth is there are stuff that we just can't do. Um, uh, there, are, there are so many really, really important things that we can't do when we're in this um, distance learning mode. And so it's actually, I guess that's one of the benefits that's come out of this as well is helping us to appreciate what we have when we have the kids there in the classrooms with us and, and on campus. Um, we're in a slightly different situation from the other schools here that we haven't reopened yet. Um, in France, France was hit pretty hard by this whole thing, and we still, in the Ile de France, we're in what they call a red zone, which means the infection rates are still a little bit of a concern. So although the authorities have said that schools, the, the elementary school kids, we can open, um, we've chosen not to yet um, because our community is a bit um, unsure about that. So, But we will, for the last couple of weeks of school, we'll have some time where the kids come back onto campus. We'll have half of the lower school kids at a time and they will, um, so in a social distance way. Our older kids, our middle school and upper school kids will only come back for a day per grade level and that'll just be social emotional, a chance for them to reconnect with their friends, say goodbye to kids that they're not gonna see for um, maybe for, forever, you know? And, um, uh, and so we're really thinking about planning for the fall. I guess we'll talk about that more a bit later. Um, I think that the learning stretches are amazing. You know, I still find myself every morning when I wake up you're sort of pleased I don't have to commute to school, but still pinching myself and feeling like this is this can't be real. You know, this it's like we are really living in some sort of strange dream, uh, nightmare or something. 
And, you know, I, I say to my son, you know, this pandemic is just so global. And of course he laughs at the dad joke because of course, by definition, it's global, but, it, but it's just, we haven't lived through anything where we feel where it's really, everybody has uh, been affected by this thing. And there are positive outcomes because of that. And there are some pretty awful outcomes as well. Um, and, um, but, you know, learning to balance the whole, how do we encourage people to be innovative and at the same time, look after them and take them at the pace that they can go at, you know, um, there's enough stress as it is without pushing people too hard. Great, thank you, Larry. And it's interesting. So uh, I think the important thing that you highlighted is France has been hit really hard. And, and with uh, that situation, it seems understandable that the way the government is reacting in your community seems only natural, especially with the high death rate that you uh, highlighted. Also, the other thing that I thought was really interesting that you highlighted was the things that we do well face to face and how maybe now we appreciate them more. And I think that's really uh, an interesting point that we should definitely come back to is what are the things that we had to let go that really we miss or maybe how can we re uh, imagine them in a virtual learning environment if this becomes you know the new normal. So those are some great points. Thank you. Uh, next is Will. Howdy all, could you share my slides too, John? Yes. Um, as it's coming up, so my name's Will Kirkwood. I work in Zurich International, at Zurich International School as the one of the EdTech coaches or EdTech coordinators. We're about 1,200 plus kids, or just under uh, 1,300 kids from EY to grade 12. Um, we're also, like Kim, we've uh, returned for about three, three weeks, and, but we're in a different situation. We only have a week and a half left. So we're actually really close to the end. So um, in that way, we're sort of slightly different in that, in that term. So let's get going. So for us, our whole online learning experience, similar length of time as many other schools around Europe of the eight, nine week sort of range, um, after sort of getting the system set up, work really well, that whole blend of synchronous Google Meet sort of style things and asynchronous sort of activities. Um, when the government chain had the new guidelines come out, May 11th was our sort of magical date where we could return in some form. Um, but Switzerland being Switzerland and sort of the, the, the regional aspect of it all, that different regions were able to come up with uh, different interpretations of the guidelines. So for Zurich, that meant sort of kids had to stay in groups of 15 and that really only applied for kids in elementary age. So that grade five is that sort of the blurred point of it. So elementary, we've returned to school with groups of 15. We maintained our online program. So some families have chosen to stay home. So it's only, we opened with four split classes and each class was assigned two teachers. So we've used our specialist teachers inside a classroom. So they take breaks with each other and they replace each other. So teachers get a break inside there. We've had to open up two more split classes because some of the kids who planned to return actually came back when they, when we returned. So we had to sort of play around with space a little bit inside there. So that's elementary school in middle school and up the sort of guidelines are actually much smaller groupings are only allowed and length of time and social distancing is much more complicated for that group. So middle school, each advisory group, so not a specialist subject or sorry, um, electives and the like like that is returns for two hours twice a week in the afternoon. So they maintain the full online program and they come in and do social emotional stuff with their advisory group two times a week and high school is not, has not returned. And I would doubt that they would return. There is a press conference tomorrow with the next sort of uh, slate of changes for the Swiss policy, but I would doubt that would affect our plans considering we're finishing next Friday. So uh, yeah, so whole online experience work really well. Returning to school has been actually amazing. Uh, for, especially for the low, obviously lower school has a very sort of unique situation inside there. Um, it's, I never thought like a lesson I've learned is I never sort of thought how complicated laying out playground zones. So one group of 15 stays together and they stay together during pickup and how that logistical thing worked out. And I have a great appreciation for anyone who works in a factory and those processing systems of how to move, I don't know, 450 kids out of a, out of a school in the afternoon is really interesting. 
Um, so I've spent a lot of time doing those, <laughs> that sort of stuff. Um, other sort of lessons we learned is that, like Kim was saying, that regular and really clear and transparent communication has been a key. First of all, with our faculty and our staff, but also with the community of getting their feedback. We found quite early on that early years parents, like I'm a parent of a kindergarten kid and an early years kid, and the whole online learning experience for this at that age group was really complicated and sort of adjusting and tweaking things along the way. And that sort of regular and transparent communication was a lifesaver for all, I think. Maintaining personal connection, like everyone says, one of the big highlights has been that sort of, yes, a shift in tech from all uses, but also the highlighting and importance of incorporating action inside there. So we've been super lucky that our faculty was pretty up to speed with tech anyway, and sort of our online systems were well established beforehand. So it was great to see them, but how everyone came at it with an, a, a positive, like I approach, try to approach things with a smile on my face, but I think that's an attitude that a lot of people have tried to take. We're just trying to make the best of this situation since we've returned. And yes, there's complications. Like I'm trying to work out how do we get iPads from kids who are still learning at home before the end of the year, but we'll work it out somehow and it'll happen. No need to stress too much about it. Great. So, that's our Thank journey. you, Will. Uh, again, you know, I think that all three of you have kind of emphasized this idea of communication and clarity and regular communications, what I think is something that all schools are realizing that really adds to the value and also maybe some of the confusion is just having that constant connection. I think Kim, you used the word connection. And then Will, I really like this idea of being positive because there are a lot of things that, you know, this long term confinement really gets mentally to people. And I think especially, uh, you know, if kids are coming in and who knows what they're dealing with in their home environment is that positive attitude can be very contagious and powerful. So that's really nice to hear. We're going to turn to our last uh, guest here, Chris from uh, Zug, International School of Zug and Lucerne. And let me get your slide deck up. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, John, and uh, hi to all. Um, yeah, as Will uh, alluded to, despite the fact that uh, we are just down, the, down the, the way a little bit, 20 minutes or so, um, in a different canton, and uh, it has been um, yeah, markedly different. And, and also, um, the, the school's uh, timing, um, we're open, well, we start a little bit later and finish a little bit later, uh, and that's been exacerbated by the fact that uh, ZIS um, cut their spring break uh, by a week. So we, we've still got another three weeks or so to go. Um, but uh, so my name is Chris Vincent, the Director of Technology at the International School of Zugan Luzerne. Um, our school is a school of around 1,250 students um, from EY1, grade three year olds, through to grade 12. Um, and we're on uh, two different campuses um and yeah central switzerland so so currently um like like will uh, and others we have been guided by uh the canton in and what we need to do um or should be doing and um so 11th of may uh was a time when the canton uh said or their definition of non-compulsory education was uh, is effectively grade nine down to could should uh, return to school in some fashion and, and so what we've done effectively is break up uh, that that coincided with six weeks of school remaining um, and so we've been looking at it at, uh, conveniently two week chunks um, and in the first of those two weeks chunks our primary school uh, returned on a sort of A cohort, B cohort, uh, and as uh, Will said, those cohorts uh, stayed together. So essentially the grades or the homeroom was split in half um, so that alphabetically those families with the same, uh, with children in the same family would be on campus uh, for two days. Then we had a break, a planning day, uh, and then the second cohort would come in for two days. Uh, and that went on for about uh, two weeks. Uh, at the same time with middle school, we chose because of um, restrictions around size or space and also concerns about 
uh, teachers being, uh, you know, potentially uh, teaching 100 students or so, the model is different in middle schools to primary school, we we responded to the more social emotional needs of the students and we um, introduced some 90 minute activity sessions, elective sessions, if you like, uh, that just gave the students an opportunity to come in and explore something. And the nice thing with that is many of those have been run by alumni who, of course, have been you know, sent home from universities. Uh, they've been here in our community and, and uh, many of them reached out and wanted to, to do something, which has been really nice. Um, this past week, um, we have brought back all primary school students uh, five days a week, um, but keeping them very much in their um, homeroom bubbles, including when they, where they have lunch and also the spaces on the playground and when they get collected. Middle school, um, we are bringing back a grade a day. And so over the, these nine days through to the next two week cycle, uh, each grade will come back for uh, three days. And essentially, they are just continuing with their online program, but with um, a teacher mentorship. But they're not in the classrooms, they're in larger spaces, and it and looks very different. Um, high school, we have had special needs. You know, those needing additional support have come in. Some of the art students have come in. Um, but the canton will make a decision as to whether or not they will come or return um, from the 8th of June, which will just give us a neat... Um, eight and a half days before the, the school year finished. Um, I should point out the attendance for primary school, middle school uh, this week has been 90%. Um, so certainly the community have responded positively. And I think they've been um, assured by the, the measures, the communications that uh, have taken place. Um, and also I think they're just dead keen to have the children out of the house and um, back at school. But uh, so that, that has been a positive piece. Um, the lessons learned, yeah, uh, counterparts have mentioned a number of those, that the communication piece, um, reaching out to, to the parents, even you know, very early on having a, a, a large Zoom meeting at a uh, big parent town hall, which we had over 300 uh, at, attend, uh, and we've kept that sort of communication and feedback up and, uh, as Will mentioned, continue to adapt and um, change our approach. Um, I, I think uh, well, we mentioned the faculty uh, shared on the slide some of the um, lovely uh, videos that the, the faculty got together and made um, and highlighting the connection the, uh, that they feel with their students. Um, you know, there really is, um, well, those, those connections has already been mentioned are, are really important. Other things that uh, I sort of learned um, is that, you know, schools typically, we think of them as slow moving um, environments, um, slow to respond to change, but uh, clearly we have all responded very quickly to dramatic change. So schools can be agile places. Um, and I think that's helpful as we move on and think about um, yeah, best ways or, or, you know, is what we're doing at the moment or have what we've been doing before um, the, the lockdowns, was that the best way for learning to happen? Um, so I think that's helpful. And the other piece is, you know, trusting the students and bringing them to the table, asking them more. Um, and I think that will have implications for more sort of personalized learning, um, students being involved in, in deciding their learning paths um, or defining what they want to learn a little bit more as we, as we move forward. I should um, leave it uh, for some other others to speak. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. And definitely, if you have not seen the International Zug of Lucerne's videos, do they're wonderful, just beautiful, and uh, just really uplifting. And hats off to those faculties for coming up with that. I'm sure you're getting a lot of it. Chris, I thought it was really interesting you brought this issue about trust and bringing the kids to the table. And I think that's something that's very exciting that hopefully we'll come back and explore further this idea of, you know, with the community. And also, you had this big town hall 
300 people? You know, how, how are we doing things differently now to ensure <clears throat> that we're engaging with these changes and making them sustainable? Uh, so what I would like to do now, and thank you, Kim, Will, Chris, and Larry for those uh, overviews. I think they really help us in setting the scene and each one very different, but also some commonalities, this idea of communication, connection, and the social emotional aspects and, and even uh, in Zurich having that session for social emotional and also in Zug, you know, bringing in the kids for those times. I think that's very interesting. What we're going to do is kind of open it to the floor. Just some protocols you have. If you go to participants, uh, you can click and then you can raise your hand. And uh, if you raise your virtual hand, I'll make sure to write your name down and then I'll call on you. And if you don't know how to do that, just raise your hand old style, just put it in front of the screen and I'll do that too. And uh, we'll just really open it to the floor. If you have questions, I think what would be nice now is give the opportunity for participants to ask questions to our guests specific to their presentations. And then also it'd be great to hear from other schools what you're doing and some of the creative tensions. And I think the overarching theme of this is what's next, you know, September comes, you know, none of us really know what's going to happen, but what are some of your schools thinking strategically? Uh, what are some things that maybe you're setting yourselves up for? Some of you are breaking up here in, in a few days, a few weeks. So already I'm, I imagine you're thinking about the return. What does it look like for a group of new teachers coming to your school and new students and new parents? Uh, are you doing things virtually? How are you setting that up? Anyway, I have my first hand up. Wayne, thank you so much for kicking off the conversation. Over to you. Thanks, John, and thanks to all the presenters. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm at the American School of uh, Milan with Stephen. Uh, we are not open and won't be open uh, for the remainder of the year. We were kind of first to close and, and last to get out of this. So it's been, I celebrate your successes. It's a little depressing watching everybody open up again. And uh, but we hope to learn from from all of you. So thank you for sharing. Kim, I was interested in your in your comment about returning to campus and getting back online requires compromises from from people. I think that's, I think you said that, or you or Larry, it was said early on, but I'd be interested to, to hear that developed. Like we all think going back is what we want, but it sounds like um, maybe there were some, some hurdles to get over in the getting back bit. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Um, yeah, I think the compromises are really that when you have 15 kids in a room and they have to be socially distanced within that space, you're, you're not going to be able to teach the way that you were. So you don't have your kids. You don't, you don't necessarily have all of your kids in that room. They may be with another teacher because we've had to have, we can only have three grade levels in primary school because we only have enough space and physical adults there um, to accommodate three grades at a time. Um, so, and I think for secondary um, as well, they, they only have one grade at a time. It compromises in terms of people's time and the schedule. Um, parents aren't happy because parents want their kids back. They want all of the kids back and they don't totally understand what that looks like because they, they can't even come into the school. So they, they can't see what's actually going on. So that's where the communication piece is super important and clarifying to the families. Like we get it, we, we know you all want all your kids back. <laughs> But we would like to have them all back too. But this is a, we've got to make compromises all over the place. So the schedule is a compromise. The recess is a compromise where the kids can play. Um, duty schedules are a compromise. At lunchtime, we've, we can't go to the cafeteria. There's no hot food. So it's all those kinds of logistics that have, are being planned and thought through. And, you know, of course, the first week back, we made loads of mistakes and as our best laid plans, right? And you, saw, you, know, you thought, oh, we could have picnicking you know, out on the playground. No, that was a disaster area. <laughs> so we, we pulled it back and, and said, okay, we're, you know, that's what's been so great about our principal, our primary principal. Um, she's just been great at saying, hey guys, hands up. I, that was a mistake. Didn't work the way I thought it was going to work. What are we going to do next? You know, so everybody's just been on board with the constant change and reflecting and yeah, any, being, any, being ready to thanks. make changes. Thanks for that. Any, any silver linings from the, you know, the necessity to regroup kids? Like that just seems like such a trauma, as you mentioned, to parents and kids and everybody else, relationships built over the course of time. And then your last four weeks, you were with some other teacher in a different group of kids. Are there any silver linings to this? 
Um, I don't know. Honestly, yeah. I don't know. The kids, the kids are frustrated and we've yeah. got kids who are leaving permanently. They're not coming back. And so this is how they're finishing out their school year. There's yeah. no birthday cakes. There's no parties. There's, you know, so I don't know. It's, I, I can't, I wish yet. I could say there were, but I haven't, I haven't seen any real benefits from the way we've had to come back right now. It's just been, it's just been hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kim. I have uh, John Adams that has his hands up. Before you start, John, just a reminder, we have the chat and I know a lot of you will be sharing links and thoughts. Do use the chat. Uh, we keep the chat. We record this and we'll send it out so you'll have access to any sidebar conversations. Or if there's something happening and you thought, let me just talk to this person, the chat is open and feel free to use it. John Adams, uh, thank you and over to you. Sure. Thanks, uh, John Adams. I'm in Luxembourg with John Micton. Uh, it's thank you all for taking the time and sharing with us your experience. It's really valuable. Uh, one thing I'd be curious to hear um, is, and Larry, Larry, I think it was you who touched on it a little bit, that idea of like teacher's comfort level with change and what are we doing differently? Uh, because when this all started, all these people were putting out articles on Twitter and we were all retweeting, you know, this will change education and it's great and in theory it sounds really nice and then as we're coming back i was noticing today all of the processes we put in place are to hold on to parts of normal school uh and trying to find that balance between doing something new and not causing too much stress is, is a real real tough thing right now but i'd be curious to hear if there's anything that the four of you or anyone else are doing that is truly different than what we were doing before and how are you going about that and uh you know not just now maybe but when we return in the fall as well. Thanks. Will will answer Different that in a question. good way. Yeah. Will, go ahead, please. Um, Thank you, John. So, hi, question. John. Uh, good question. Um, obviously, like, like Kim's answer of coming back to compromises and stuff like that and what has changed, of realizing that kids just want to reconnect with other humans is the, the key element and the underlining sort of factor of the the need to sort of do away with what old education look like of going back and sort of reestablishing those connections and those classroom communities and how we interact as, as a community has been sort of one of the real highlights and kids actually having the language to articulate how they need to connect and why they need to connect, I think has been the sort of one of those silver linings of the whole experience of like, even my four-year-old can talk about how she wants to interact with a person and why she wants to. And that language you hear in the class, you hear on the playground now, and it's brought a much deeper sort of social and emotional uh, understanding for the kids, but also for teachers too, because they've lived through it as well. So that sort of rallying around the need that we need human connection, I think has probably been my biggest highlight or the biggest takeaway at least from the return. Thank you, Will. Any other thoughts from our guests or anybody in, on, in the room that they, you know, in response to John's great question here about, Larry, thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is, we, we all echo the same thing. I think um, I've been really impressed with teachers, all sorts of different teachers, you know, some of whom were pretty uncomfortable with tech earlier on, who have embraced some really, really great new approaches. And, and that's been exciting. But, you know, this thing has been such a marathon and, it's, and there's no end in sight. <laughs> it's like... It's really like, you know, you've just done so well. You, know, you say to these people, you've just, you've just climbed this really amazing hill and, and they get to the top and they just realize that there's another bigger one <laughs> still coming. And it's just, it's really, really hard on people. And so, you know, especially as we're planning for this hybrid approach, you know, saying to teachers, you've really got to step back. And, you know, like you, if you're only going to have half your kids there at a time, you can't afford to be thinking, oh, I'm just going to take twice as long to cover the curriculum then. I mean, I'm just going to teach to half the kids today and the next half of the kids tomorrow. You have to really be thinking about how can those kids who are at home still be covering material as well? You know, how can you, how can you be super creative? Is it sort of like a, an, a, a, like a big version of the flipped classroom where you say, okay, so there's going to be some time when you're with me and we can maximize the benefits of that. But I really need you still to be doing stuff which is worthwhile when you're not with me. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, so can teachers sort of get this enlarged idea of a flipped classroom idea? And so, but this is, it's hard on teachers. You know, there are teachers who are exhausted. They've worked really, really hard. And I think it's interesting because for all of us, you know, we're, the, we're people who are always trying to encourage people to try new things and be innovative and that. But we, 
I've never been in a situation like this where people, they're still positive, but they're just exhausted. And so that's the challenge is how to keep people moving forward at a pace that they can cope with. Could I Thank just jump, jump in there yeah. with that, Larry? How are you, because we're ending the year in five weeks and I think we have more time than it sounds like a lot of you. How are you getting that feedback from the teachers to help inform the beginning of next year with that exhaustion level? Yeah, so we've done some surveys, but we're actually also now just doing group meetings in the divisions and in smaller groupings. And, and we really, um, um, I mean, we really need everyone's input on it because we need teachers to go through the process of looking at these ideas and grappling. It was interesting, yesterday we had a meeting and I was talking to some upper school science teachers and initially one of them said, I just can't do that. How can I teach, you know, how can I cover the ground if I've got half the class today and half the class tomorrow? And another teacher says, oh, well, in our science lab, I can really see how I can start to split out the stuff that I do, which you've got to be there physically. I want to be able to use the apparatus and things like that. And then there's other stuff that you can do. And it was just great because over the course of the conversation, these two teachers, you could see their thinking start to move. They were saying, it's not an option to throw up our hands and say, we can't do it. This could be what school looks like for a long time. This could be the whole of next school year. So how can we really start to get constructive? So it's really, really important. I think that we have lots of conversations with teachers. Everyone gets a chance, even the crazy ideas, they get a chance to put them up there and say, hey, what about this? And then I, I think everyone has to feel as if they're part of, creating this new thing and there has to also be i think some differentiation like there are some teachers who like so the science teachers were happy with that sort of approach there are some uh, french teachers who are saying you know i really was happy with it after quarantine when we had some kids uh, after february break we had some kids in quarantine at home and we i was teaching my class at school but i had a few kids who had a buddy uh, there was a kid at home and a kid with a buddy and, and they had a buddy in the class and they had zoom on their phone or something like that and the kids were part of the classroom discussion even though they weren't there and I've always been sort of loath to encourage the idea that teachers are going to be teaching distance learning mode and face to face at the same time. I think that's awful. I think that's very, very demanding for teachers, but you can see how there could be a compromise in there. It could be that, yes, it's okay to have a discussion about this text that we're working on with some of the kids not physically in the room, but they're still there because they're connected via a, you know, a video conference and tool. Thank you, Larry. And I think this is, you know, and this theme comes up again, that the idea of trust and letting people have that voice and that space to kind of try out those ideas. Chris, please. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, we're talking about uh, mentioning the importance of the teachers and how tired they are. Um, so as well as listening to them and giving them uh, forums uh, in which to, to feedback and inform how we move forward, um, we've also taken care to um, be cognizant of the, of the load. So sort of changing the expectations around reports um, and uh, assessments, just uh, making it feasible. We've even introduced uh, a mechanism by which, or to incorporate um, students' reflections uh, into those final reports. So as the, the learning that they've clearly had uh, over this uh, lockdown period, isn't lost and we capture that and, and feed that back to the to the parents and at the same time just uh, alleviating uh, the demand on on the teachers who have done you know, so much. Thank you Chris and I think the report card writing is a, is a whole other thread because that brings about so many questions and we just had a big debate in our upper school about should we have a graded report or not and fascinating conversation and what are the expectations of parents and kind of what has been the precedent and how do you suddenly switch things so thank you chris for that uh wing thank you um <clears throat> so i'm i'm new to europe i just uh, arrived in milan in august and i'd been in africa for 12 years before that um and i have been surprised at how many conversations sort of end in well because gdpr <laughs> and that's it. And then you just don't go any further. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if any of you talking about, you know, engaging the kids while they're at home, but there's stuff going on in the classroom, just Larry, what you were talking about, I think right there. Uh, how are you threading the GDPR needle with uh, simultaneous classroom and at home learning as these kids are rotating through their ninth grade English class or whatever? Or does anybody have a, a good solution for that? I, I mean, I kind of hope the government's just going to say, okay, yeah, you're right. This is too hard. Go ahead and film whatever you want. But I kind of also worry that's not going to come in time. I guess the only, the only um, 
the only way that we considered that was that we 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 advised our teachers not to record zoom sessions not to record anything and really largely because of that you know we don't know what that camera might capture that's happening in the background in someone's home and we don't we don't really don't want to be responsible for that footage um and so we've just sort of sidestepped it a bit because we just made it really clear to parents and families that they have some responsibility for making sure that where the kid is participating in their lessons is. is yeah, I guess I'm not talking forward. about the, um, the, the kids zooming in from home. I'm talking about filming what's going on. Are, are you recording what's going on in the classroom? So those kids at home who are on the, the gold team or the blue team or the, the non on campus team can follow on as you were just talking about both uh, in classroom and distance learning simultaneously, the same class. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, are you imagining recording what's going on in the classroom, or not recording it, but or projecting it, live streaming it, so that those kids at home can follow what their other fifteen classmates are doing uh, live in the classroom? So I can answer that. In our school, we use Schoology conferencing. So we have ten kids in the room and ten kids at home. And what the teachers have is Schoology open. It's a chat room. They have the audio on. The video shows whatever's on the screen. And then the kids can communicate with each other. They can do the chat. So the kids in the classroom are kind of at a desk interacting with Schoology. So Schoology is kind of the equalizer for both entities. Uh, and that seems to have worked. We definitely are doing that in the high school. I can let John Adams talk a bit more about what's happening in the lower school. I know that Chris put his hand up regarding the GDPR. Just what we have done with GDPR, we've actually, and I have to thank Kim because she uh, gave me some resources. We actually made a list of apps and programs and websites that were GDPR compliant that we had mapped and we built a website and people are told use these. Don't go looking for something else. And it's quite robust. And we, my digital learning coaches, I must give them credit. They busted their buns. We actually had one of the librarians just do mapping full time for eight weeks while we were doing this. So we could make sure that our DPO could give the stamp of approval. So that's how we went about it. So we have like a curated best of list of interactive apps, websites, and things like that. And we're really gearing people to that. Uh, I don't know if the authorities are going to say no or, you know, what, what their stance is, but we're feeling this is still a good learning lesson and people have been very mindful of it much more than before, which is interesting. Uh, and so that's how we've kind of addressed that. But I do want to go back to Chris because he had his hand up and I know he wanted to share something. Chris, thank you, Larry, for your input there. Yeah, I, I know, Wayne, that uh, you sort of altered the question, but I was just going to say in terms of, you know, child protection and uh, data protection, you know, they remain fundamentally important. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not needs must, we, we forget about them. Um, and, and, you know, with the, an, another aspect of the applications and different tools, um, you know, I think we're doing teachers a favor by keeping a fairly uh, tried and tested palette in the first instance, um, you know, freeing up that cognitive space for not only the teachers, but also the students as they are getting used to a, a different uh, uh, a way of working in, in many cases. Um, and then slowly expanding that out as teachers want to e explore, uh, similarly to what John mentioned, just in, testing, making sure that the, the tool is, is uh, or meets the expectations around privacy. Um, but we, we also, like Larry, uh, we were guided, I think uh, it was came in, coming out of CIS, uh, possibly advising not to video. Um, and so for Google Meet, we didn't even turn that function on uh, for, for teachers to avert that, um, that potential issue. But we also have st very clear steps on, um, you know, if a, a teacher was to, or a counselor was to engage, uh, need to engage with a, a student by themselves, the parent will be invited, another faculty member, membership of a uh, leadership team would be invited on that video conferencing call. Great, thank you very much. Hopefully Wayne, that kind of addressed some of your 
questions. And if you can look in the chat, I know some other people are kind of uh, adding to that uh, topic. I'd like to open to other participants. Does anybody have a question to the panelists or something that they would like to share? We'd really like to hear what you're going through and what are some of the uh, creative tensions that you're engaging with. Everybody's being very polite. I'll jump in quick though, John. I just yeah, wanted to please. Say Thank you, Kim. Second, that report card tension. I think that has been really difficult for teachers. Um, and I understand our leadership team had to take a long time to think about what should this be? I mean, so I, not that we want to open that conversation now, that's perhaps another L2 thread to even have is how yeah. are schools dealing with reporting and all of the issues around that? Can we even trust what the kids have done at home if they haven't, you know, it's a it's a man landmine of of topics and issues we could talk about, but that's brought a lot of stress lately. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. and I agree. It's it's a meaty topic, and we will definitely go to the highest levels of learning too to suggest that this might be a topic. <laughs> Aaron, thank you. Your hand up, Aaron. Over to you. There, I'm unmuted. Um, first of all, thank you for thank all the information you for, uh, sharing. This has been really uh, useful. And hi, Kim. <laughs> Um, what, what I'm wondering is, uh, my school's already making some noise about or talking about um, fall will not be the same as fall that we just had in 2019, but we don't really have a strong idea yet of what that will mean. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will start the school year, everyone at home distance learning. We may actually have um, some opportunities because the Dutch government is very flexible um, to restructure how August looks, how September looks, how a whole school year looks. And I'm wondering if any other schools have some ideas that you're hitting around or that you're putting in place very concretely to say our school year will look different or our school week or school day will look different from now on because this has been an opportunity for us to really rethink how we want to run a school and how we want students to learn with us. Great question, Aaron. Thank you. So uh, anybody would like to talk a bit about that? I know John and I have a meeting tomorrow on this topic, so <laughs> we'll report after that. Just to, just to jump in real quick, um, Wayne put in an uh, article earlier that somebody had sent to us, John Mixon and I, yesterday, and it's definitely worth reading because it's like the top things that you could do differently. Some of them are things you would imagine, but there are things in there like develop an individualized learning plan for every student, which is pretty cool to imagine. And so there are some things in there, so John and I are going to talk about that, that tomorrow, but yeah, it's definitely worth reading the article if you haven't yet that Wayne posted. Thank you, Wayne, for doing that. So what are some of your schools thinking about here for the fall? I, I mean, you must be, as, uh, Will, thank you. I'll have a shot. Aaron, we, we don't have an answer, let's say that. So there is talk, obviously, for all of us, it's based on our government, uh, on the government decisions of how that return looks. We imagine if things play out numbers wise, still the same, that our lower school will look a little bit more like normal than it did before maybe just because of the how the Swiss government's been approaching cases for younger children so maybe it might approach to a more normalish style but probably still confined groups and being able to trace groupings and stuff like that how to return the middle school and high school is a really big question because we can't run a full elective a full program because teachers can only, the kids can only can come in contact with one teacher so until that guideline sort of shifts then maybe we do have to rethink how school looks if that the guideline sticks that maybe you have to go to a more lower school model that has not even hit the table but um how does that work when kids go change groupings all the different time with middle school and high school is something on the table but there's sort of a hope that the government will come out with revised guidelines in the tomorrow's press conference, which might give a little bit more clarity around potential discussions. But I think we're in that holding pattern waiting for further direction. And Will, has the Swiss government said that the kids can only be with one adult? Uh, that you want to minimize. So they define kids basically older than 11 as to have similar risk as adults. And then the number and the interaction, social distancing of adults is much more strict of how that works. So that's much more liberal with how younger kids deal with. So that's why it's a bit more open down there. And that's the big issue. <laughs> oh, it's, that's not Switzerland. That's also Switzerland and Zurich. 
So it's the overlay of the cantonal rules too. And there's a question here. Kersey, maybe that's a great question to ask. Do you mind asking it to the floor? Thank you. I guess one of the questions, hi, I'm Karisti and I'm from um, Anglo-American School of Moscow. And um, one of the conversations we've been having, we're not sure what the Russian government is going to say um, as far as any kind of guidance in that area. And we are not going back this school year, but we're, talk we're looking at plans for fall. And I guess it has anyone had any experience where they haven't any of the local governments or what have you haven't come out and said that there has to be a limit on number of adults, particularly for upper school, middle school and high school? Um, or has everyone who has gone back, have there been pretty strict guidelines as to the number of interactions? In Luxembourg, we don't have a limit of teachers, but we have kids have to stay together. So that's for the contact tracing. So our cohorts are always the same. John, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have, for example, in the lower school, we have the homeroom teachers, but then specialist tag team with them to support them during lunch and breaks. And in the upper school, the same thing. So teachers physically come to the room, but the cohort of kids is always the same. And the logic is that you can maybe have a better idea of what teachers are coming in than mixing kids. So the kids always stay the same and they can't interact with other groups. So that's how Luxembourg has done it. And so our homeroom teacher, so for example, my wife's a middle school homeroom teacher. She does homeroom and then she's EAL and she's going into other people's classroom. But those cohorts are always the same. Those kids from morning to night are basically moving as a pack and interacting as a pack. But the teachers are coming in and out. That's a much def better definition of how we do it. Yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. how, does that, how does that play out then with if you have say that one cohort of kids, but they have a different world language and they have a different, they have, you know, health or drama or they have PE or they have art, they have different classes. Okay, you... I'm, yeah, that's a good question. And I'm, Erin's got her hand up and I'm gonna let her uh, answer that question because I think it'd be good to hear from other schools. Thank you for your question, Kersey, excellent. I can't really say I'm other schools because I'm at, I'm at Kim school. Um, yeah, but still. <laughs> but I'm at the secondary school. So um, we have done exactly that. We've broken our kids up into groups of, depending on the day in the cohort, anywhere between 10 and 15 kids. Um, initially, when we went back into distance learning, we cut our timetable in half. So we went from six periods a day to three. Um, and we kept that for the kids that are on campus. So they still only have three periods and it's the same three periods that the, it's, we kept the distance learning timetable the same, even though some of the kids are on campus. Um, so I've spent the last two weeks making giant spreadsheets of all possible combinations of kids that could be together and see as many specialist teachers as they could during that day. So for example, if, I, if we have a day where, um, like today, we had foreign languages met, English met, and humanities met, I sorted the kids by humanities and foreign language. And kept, so I had groups of kids that were like history and Spanish. And then in English, they're all like the whole cohort's doing the same thing. So those groups worked. So we ended up with nine groups of kids and the subject teacher or the specialist teachers as best we could rotated to the kids. It's not easy. It's, it's a logistical nightmare. Um, like I said, I've got spreadsheets of all different possible combinations of kids as much as I can. Um, it's not perfect. And we knew from the day that the government said, hey, start bringing kids back that it wasn't going to be perfect because we didn't have a lot of notice. Um, but at this point, it's as good as it's going to get probably for the next five weeks. But we've already started some big discussions about how this will be completely different when, when we come back in August and what. We, we've got our distance learning plan. Kim, Kim talked a lot about our distance learning plan. It's actually in secondary. It's been really good. Um, you know, we're missing that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but but it's, we've done pretty well with it, I think, for the most part. Um, Obviously, our normal timetable is a normal timetable. It's, you know, we're, we're, we can work with that. It's that kind of, in, it's this intermediate space that we're in right now that we're really trying to make the best of. And we haven't found, we haven't found the solution yet. I think we, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we will by August. Um, like I said, we've started some big conversations and there are sketches on whiteboards all over the secondary school um, as to what it might look like. So we'll, we'll get there, but it's, it's, it's tough right now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Erin, for that input. That's really helpful. Kim? Just to add on to what Aaron said, having a secondary school, have two secondary school kids at our school, I think one of the best things that happened during distance learning was we really, since they reduced the, the lessons, there's three lessons, the kids almost always had a live 
meet with their teacher, even for the beginning, just to get them started. So kids were never kind of abandoned to just go off and distance learn. There was always, it was synchronous and asynchronous in a way. So they had a meeting with the teacher. They could see their, their student, the other students in the class on the screen and the teacher. And I think it really provided that anchor for the kids going through this. As hard as that is to maintain that sort of synchronous schedule, it did make a difference, I think, for my own kids watching them in secondary. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do want to come back to Aaron's question and maybe hear from some other people. Uh, you know, what does the fall look like? Are you coming up with plan A, B, and C, like full on, partially virtual, full virtual, or combinations? I'm wondering if anybody with their leadership teams or even in their grade teams or whatever cohorts you're working with, what are you thinking here? It would be great to hear some ideas and what some people are ruminating. Yes, Aaron. I'm going to answer my own question, I guess, um, and say that what we're talking about here at ISH is at least starting the year with distance learning in place, because the uh -huh. return to school plan that we have for coming up soon through the end of the school year is really distance learning will continue. And then this, this idea that I've heard others of you mentioned, the, the one grade level or year group per day as a way to come and just have guided study sessions on campus. But we will not be teaching lessons in front of our own students. Uh, the students will be in these kind of isolated cohorts that you're talking about, a meter and a half apart from each other. And the primary uh, vehicle of instruction will continue to be the distance learning things we put in place now. And our assumption and plans for fall are to at least in August and September start that way. Uh, students may come to campus, new students who arrive might come and get a tour and pick up a laptop and then hit the road. And they will largely be continuing to work at home um, unless things drastically improve and schools are fully reopened or things go the other direction and schools are fully closed. And uh, I, I don't know that they have a, a solution that says, and we're going to keep that up because we like it in the long term, or this is what we're going to do until the government tells us otherwise. And this is because you don't, that's you deciding that, or is that because the government is saying, encouraging you to go down that road, or is that more an independent decision of your own community? Uh, it's a bit of both. Um, the Dutch are giving quite a bit of leeway, uh, and currently they're not requiring that schools reopen fully in the fall. Uh, they are oh. doing this kind of three-week game where uh, we, we had a press conference a little while ago that said secondary schools will open after the June 1st holiday. And here are the very narrow parameters, you know, this many students in a room, this far apart from each other, as little movement as possible. And the school interpreted that, and I think safely so, to say, therefore, most of us will be at home doing the distance learning thing. And, Interesting. And the, the plan so far is to continue that until we hear otherwise. And the school does have some leeway as long as we can show, uh, because we are, uh, we receive public money, so students have to show that they're receiving education. <laughs> yeah. And as long as we can track the attendance and the hours and say, no, the, the children did have 180 plus days of school and the days were this many hours long. Um, but how that happens, we actually have some flexibility. And um, a, as an international school, we're pretty well set up. Um, the Dutch public schools have really suffered. <laughs> they, they've lost quite a few kids. Yeah. And I think that's the case for many countries. The public school systems mm -hmm. have really been stretched. Yeah. Uh, because of this. And I know in Luxembourg, one of the biggest things was the large amount of kids that fell through the cracks and the government just felt we need to get them, we need to see where they are and that they're alive and let's get them back in the classroom. So that's an interesting, is anybody else? Uh, yes, Kirsty, thank you. I know one of the things we've been looking at is <clears throat> because uh, Russian schools typically don't go back until September 1st. And so the real, the reality of the much guidance coming out for what the expectation is will probably be later than our typical calendar. We've also kind of like Aaron mentioned, we've, we've talked about we were, are probably going to start with distance learning and that might look different divisionally. We're, we're still in the process of talking through all of this. Um, and so it might just be some maybe elementary starts a little bit later with less distance learning as opposed to our IB students are able to start sooner, particularly um, our 11th or 12th graders who have been working with those teachers already. Um, but we've also been looking at then what would a hybrid kind of um, alternating kids on campus, um, if there be, we're anticipating limits on kids in a room. And so 
what that's going to look like for us and then being able to get back on campus. But the reality of having to go, probably at some point in time, having to go to distance learning again. And so wanting to be thoughtful about whatever we put in place is something that's a little bit more, it's more seamless. It's not gonna be completely seamless, but some being thoughtful that over the next year that we're, we might have to be going in and out of phases simply because the Russian government could say, like we had already made the decision to close, but one of the international schools in town, they did have a student that was COVID positive. And so they asked that the school had to close the next day. So the reality, we don't know if that will still be the case come fall, if it will be just a cohort, if it will be the whole school. So knowing that we have to be flexible with that. And so that's kind of part of our conversations as well as to what kind of total face-to-face -face everybody on campus, a hybrid distance learning and how those all work together to support each other. And because we won't be able to take three days or a week to prep for distance learning like we did in the spring because it was completely new to us. So yeah. that's yeah. part of our thoughts. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Chris. I was just going to say, um, and, and like Karisti, you know, a similar approach, um, but a couple of schools uh, recently, a American school in Japan, and I think uh, uh, a Mount, Mount Vernon it's a private uh, denominational school in the US have shared out to their documents about uh, planning. And uh, a piece that I noticed that was common to both was the, the risk, the response, or the way schools would move forward was clearly based on the risk. And, and um, uh, so that sort of risk matrix planning, um, having that in place, because as Karisti said, we, we're not going to have time uh, to think about a little bit more. Those plans, those strategies uh, moving forward have to be in place. And we, as a leadership, need to be uh, ready to um, respond quickly uh, to them. And I think that is that is one of the advantages I feel for you, Larry, and, and actually also ZIS. Um, we've had the fortunate situation also, Wayne, you mentioned it. I guess there is a, a fortunate situation in that we have enough time for actually potentially all of our divisions to, to come back and um, do a little bit of trial by error perhaps learn from the experiences, get the faculty, get the students, get our parent community uh, back to just sensing, just feeling what it might like, what it might likely be uh, in, in August. And that's, that's been helpful, or will be helpful. Great, yeah, that's, that's and I think that's one thing that uh, this idea of, scaffolding the round the risk is a really interesting precedent and kind of an interesting way to analyze what you come back with. And I know that we've been uh, looking at literally three different plans. One is virtual, one is hybrid, and one is normal because having all three. But I think this is again, uh, Larry alluded to it earlier, is people are exhausted. And I know I was in a leadership team meeting, crisis team meeting, and somebody was like, well, we'll be working all summer. And I was like, I need a break, you know, and, and I think we are going to need a break, however much we have to plan for the fall. And I think collectively uh, school communities just are going to need that break. And I think that's uh, really important. There, there is a question that I think would be interesting to bring out. Thank you, Kim, for sharing that. Uh, is the idea of, you know, what uh, would you like school to look like in the fall with distance learning and social distancing in place? You know, what do you think is possible? Is there something that has happened to your community and your own experience as an educator and a learner that you're thinking, wow, I really want this thing to happen in the fall because now we've done it once. Now we could actually make that part of a precedent. Any thoughts on that? Great question, Kim. Thank you. Is there something that you've done? You can answer that one, Kim, can't you? <laughs> Kim, are you going to answer your own question? Or are you? No, I'm just, I, I think it'd be interesting. What, what is one thing that you, like, and I think what Kim is alluding to, correct me if I'm wrong, is what is one thing that you have experienced that was completely different 
that you suddenly are thinking, wow, why don't we leverage this long term? This is really significant. Kim, what I was guess, yours? Um, at the beginning, I think before we started this, I think there was lots of talk about, oh, we can do um, project-based learning and we can have um, individual learning plans and rolling everybody was like, this is friggin' exhausting. Like I am, there's no way that I can they have the brain space for any of those sort of how we change school and um, that's why I'm asking that question. So given how much, how do, how do we help teachers manage it better? What tools are we using that are helping them manage it? It might open up space for them to, to think about that's, I guess, how do we help teachers managing the manager that might open up space for them to, to think about what we change so that we don't just resort to extra on the zoom um, for 45 minutes and then give the kids some work to do so what's easiest to do in a classroom and and easiest to do just as learning how to be different what what is different what's possible right and how do we create space for them to think about that great so and really i think that's kind of I'm still holding <laughs> No, but I think it's important what you're saying is this kind of idea of how do we pace this? Because as Larry said, we've climbed the hill and now there's this other big hill. And you know, how, do we, yeah, how do we pace that? What is it that we can do as leaders and educators and members of teams to kind of truncate that and give people that space and know that, okay, this is gonna be long-term. This is what we're going to set up for you. So you have those down times or recoup times. Stephen? Yes. No, it's just, um, no, it's a great question from Kim. And I think one of the issues that we've all realized going forward is, you know, in order to make a plan going forward, you have to reflect on what you've done. And we just haven't had the time and energy to actually reflect on it and measure the success of what we've done. And it's hard because like you said, you want to have that break in the summer. You don't want to spend the summer having to do those plans and the reflection. But I think this summer more than ever, it's going to be so much more important. Um, from our point of view, we are actually trying to set up a PD schedule in the summer um, because we want our teachers to have the support that they need to start the new school year with the tools that they need to get the job done, which is what, what we couldn't provide them going into distance learning in the first place, was all that kind of PD and support structure that they would need to do it. So now we're trying to develop that for the summer. It's not going to be required. It's going to be, it's going to be a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and it's going to be the expectation is that you will at least there are some that are going to be required that you have watched. So when you come back, you can say, okay, we've provided you some support and this is the expectation we have for you as teachers. Um, which I think will go a long way and we'll see how that goes. It's, it's going to be difficult, um, but I like the idea of thinking, okay, when you've had that time to reflect in the summer, let's try to pick out what did work and that we could really innovate our schools with. I think schedules is going to be one of those big things that we could actually really blow up in a school. It's one of the most restricting things. Um, but I think we've kind of proved that our, there are models where the distance learning works, especially at the higher end. You know, maybe some of those kids, those IV kids don't need to be at school every day. They could do this from home. Uh, and, and so I think we've kind of proved that does work and we have to find out. And the other part is, of course, parents have expectations as well. They see a model of international school, they pay a lot of money and they have expectations. So we also have to reflect on that and make sure parents are part of that conversation, uh, proving that we know what's best and innovating in the classroom and all those types of things are going to be great. But um, I, it does require that reflection and very active reflection um, by your leadership team. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, this is really interesting, this idea of the PD over the summer and giving you know that support. That's a great idea. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up and then Will. Yeah, similar to, well, to building on what uh, Stephen is talking about. While we, we've only just started uh, talking about it, but uh, there is potential that uh, because the reality is even in, in Europe that um, movement around Europe will be restricted. Um, and while countries are opening up, I think the statements from authorities are, are discouraging travel across borders unless you really uh, feel it's necessary. There is a real risk if Switzerland, for instance, opens up um, that we will face a, a second wave just right at the uh, end of August when we're planning to open back up. 
Uh, so what we're looking at is the possibility of our, our curriculum uh, or learning director um, managing a, a number of um, curriculum investigations, if you like, uh, spending some time looking at uh, developing materials, models uh, for use. And this would be paid time. Um, this is uh, above and beyond what we would expect our teachers to, to do. Uh, and this sort of curriculum development then uh, would be paid with some sort of uh, uh, per diem or allowance. Great. Oh, excellent. Another gr that's an interesting model too. Thank you, Chris. Will? Um, I don't have any sort of brainwaves about how we're going to sort of approach it moving forward, but I think the lesson that's sort of been drawn from it all is obviously the transparency of communication and changing is on the fly, but that whole concept of freedom within form that having the structures in place so teachers know what the minimum expectations are or parents know what the expectations, but how the teacher gets to it or how the team of teachers get to it having that freedom inside there and distributing the leadership and having enough structures in place to be able to distribute the leadership of those and trusting the faculty has been a huge part of the success of both the online and the return of it all and hopefully that will continue to be part of whatever blended or not blended or return to school process that we go through after the summer. So that sort of concept of having some structures in place, but then allowing freedom of how people move towards it for faculty and also for kids too. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, thank you, Will. I think this idea of schedule is, I know that the schedule has always been something that we never dared to touch in the upper school. And overnight we blew it up. I mean, we used to be an eight day schedule. Now we're a five day schedule. We finish at 2.30. I mean, it was just interesting how suddenly under pressure we were very comfortable re-looking at something that we would never dare touch. And I think Kim, you were alluding to that in your comment in the chat. And you know, I think there are many things that maybe we're willing to look at. I mean, I doubt two years ago, Stephen, you would have ever thought of getting people to do PD over the summer. And I, I think, you know, there again is another example. Is that something that we start exploring is, you know, not that it's mandatory, but you've had these experiences before you coming back. And I think what Chris is also alluding to, I'm just mindful of time. And I just think it'd be great if uh, we just wrap up here. And I know many people have to go to other places. And I just thought it'd be good to hear from our four panelists before we wrap up any words of wisdom or any thoughts. And then I just want to remind you, you can find this virtual thread. It will be recorded. Chat is available on the Learning to Europe site. And uh, that will be, we'll make sure that's shared out on social media when it's up and ready. But just to wrap things up, if Kim, Will, and Chris and Larry would like just to share some parting words. Um, no, it's, just, it's always good to hear other people are experiencing the same things that you're experiencing and that you're not unique in your frustration or unique in your stress. Um, and it's also great to hear people's ideas of, of what, what sticks, what stays, keep. Uh, and yeah, I might have, have to repeat that one. Like Stephen was saying, just that we can hopefully take some time we, and somebody take a breath and think. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing. Okay. Kim, yes, um, I don't think we yeah. heard anything because my, you were my teenagers, Your teenagers are on the internet. Okay. He's streaming. We are, we are fighting over the <laughs> Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? No, we can't. It's, it's very breaky. You might want to go and tell your teenager to get off Fortnite yeah, or whatever. Yes, and, and, and swap that like, laptop out. <laughs> yeah, get his. Get his new Mac Pro. <laughs> anyway, Kim, let's, I'll go through the other guests and then let's see if you can wrap up again. Yep. Will, and then over to Chris and Larry, please. Parting words, yeah. Always great to hear what other schools are going through, just from obviously to hear we're all in the same boat together, but also get new ideas out there. So always happy to share. And if anyone's got any questions or suggestions for us, please fire them, fire them away because we are all in the same, very similar boats with different government guidelines, but we're all thinking along the same lines. Thank you, Will. Chris? Um, it's been mentioned before, but uh, I, I think it is a highlight, that of community. You know, we've pointed uh, to our own communities, so the strength within uh, which 
there is there. But uh, we've also, you know, um, throughout uh, Europe, uh, L2, um, others supporting schools, the AAIE and other groups, everybody has uh, sort of opened up, uh, made software free or more accessible, etc. And I know there's marketing uh, mentality behind that. But uh, I, I think um, we've all responded and the way we've done that is reach out, sharing, uh, listening, uh, working things together and uh, it's a real strength. Thank you so much, Chris. Larry. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this. It's been really valuable, you know, just getting the, having the opportunity to, to, look, to hear what other people are, um, are able to do and are, and are struggling with too. I, I think, you know, there's so many layers to this. Uh, earlier, John, you talked about some of the logistical things that would be great for us to talk about at some stage too. You know, it's whether it's just simple things like the recalling in of resources, you know, laptops and iPads and things like that. And, and uh, it's doing, it's doing uh, graduations and things like that. But, but also I think there's a level on which, you know, there's these, these big nuts that we still have to crack. Like, you, you know, we've probably all observed that we have teachers who are still hung up on the whole assessment thing in the context of doing distance learning and they're, and they're, they're almost paranoid about kids cheating and things. And it doesn't matter how many times we say that maybe we're just assessing the wrong things. Maybe we're asking the wrong questions if you have to be worried about whether they're cheating or not. And those are things that, you know, we've been talking about for years. And yes, we've seen some progress. People are thinking about those things, but I think we need to keep pushing that stuff. You know, that whole, it, if you think that standing in front of your class lecturing for 50 minutes worked when you're in the classroom, you should be able to see now that it doesn't work when you're on Zoom <laughs> because it's just gone. You know, they're just not there any longer. So these are big things that we really have to, um, you know, I'm very, very sympathetic to my teachers, trying to take them from where they are now and have learned what they've learned and hold their hands so that it's not overwhelming. But at the same time, there are some big challenges we have to keep pushing people on. And so, you know, I'm still in the melee of all this stuff. You know, it's the nuts and bolts and it's the big stuff. And I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss these things with you all. It's great. Thank you so much, Larry. And I think the assessment again comes back with report card writing. And that's something we definitely need to address uh, through one of these forums. Kim, are you with us again? No, unfortunately, I think she's frozen. Uh, frozen. Listen, I want to thank everybody for coming and joining us. And I want to thank Simon and Stephen to do all the logistics and make sure these things happen so smoothly and learning too. And uh, I want to thank our guests. Thank you so much. I know how busy you are and I harassed you about making a slide deck and everything. And thank you so much for your input and your wisdom. Really appreciate it. And thank you for everybody being in the room. Again, we'll be uh, pushing this out. You can review and look at the chat and also the videos. And definitely, uh, we will, uh, June 3rd, we have a, a learning to thread on wellness. We have some counselors coming in to talk. And so definitely that's the next date, maybe to chalk on your calendar, Tuesday, June 3rd, or is it Wednesday, Simon? I think it's- wait, I'm uh, not sure actually, I haven't seen the calendar. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, anyway, June Wednesday. 3rd. Thank Wednesday. you, I will. And so Carol will be facilitating that and we have some counselors talking about well-being sure. and wellness uh, with faculty in school. So definitely want to chalk up on your calendar. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Uh, be safe, be well, and best of luck with uh, the last few weeks uh, with juggling all these new uh, dynamics.